All right. Hello and welcome everyone. We're so glad that you could be joining us here today. My name is Stephanie and I'm going to be one of your co-hosts. Today's webinar is one of several webinars that are a part of our what we're calling our Brain HQ Academy series. Today's topic is going to be about nutrition and brain health. All right, so let's start by going over uh, the agenda for the webinar today. Uh, so first thing that we're going to do is we're after this intro, we are going to kick off with a brief activity, get you guys thinking, get you guys engaged and ready for the rest of the presentation. Uh, after the activity, uh, Henry, whom some of you probably have seen in previous webinars before, is going to give a presentation on nutrition in the brain. For those of you that haven't seen Henry before, uh, let me do a little brief intro here. Uh, Dr. Henry Manka earned his PhD in neuroscience at the University of California, San Francisco, and that's where he studied brain plasticity with our co-founder, Dr. Michael Merzenich, and he's been running the show here at Posit Science since 2011. Um, now, part three, Henry is going to be joined in discussion with our guest, who we are very, very excited to have. Uh, we have with us today Jennifer Ventrelli. Now, Jennifer is a registered dietitian, a certified personal trainer, and an assistant professor at Rush University, and that's where she is currently uh, the lead dietitian for the Mind Diet Trial to prevent Alzheimer's. So we're so excited that she could be joining us today uh, for discussing the, this topic. All right. Uh, finally, at the end of the webinar, we are going to have an opportunity for a live Q&A where you guys can pose any of your questions about nutrition and brain health to Henry and to Jennifer. Uh, so to use the Q&A feature, uh, click the Q&A button on the Zoom control panel. A new window should pop up where you can type in your questions, and we'll do our best to answer as many of those as we can. Now, there are a lot more of you in the audience uh, than there are of us, so we're not going to have the opportunity to answer every question, but we're going to try and get to as many as we can. Now, the other thing I want to note is that the webinar today is being recorded and it will get posted to our YouTube channel in the coming days. So if you'd like to be notified when that video goes live, you can go to youtube.com slash brainhq and subscribe there in order to receive a notification when that video is up next week. Uh, additionally, everyone who's registered for this webinar will also receive an email sometime next week with any follow-up resources that we may be covering, uh, but that will also include a link to the replay. All right, uh, so let's go ahead and move on to our activity here. We're calling this activity food for thought. So what we're gonna be doing is we are gonna be putting uh, images of two similar foods on screen. And uh, the question that we are gonna pose to you all is, which is healthier for the brain? Uh, so you can go ahead and use that chat button on the Zoom control panel to type in your answers there. Our first question is, what do you think is healthier for the brain? Do you think it's white chocolate or dark chocolate? Now, Jen, I don't know about you, but I'm definitely a dark chocolate fan. <laughs> agreed, agreed. Dark chocolate is is my preferred chocolate of choice. Yeah. I used to joke with friends that like white chocolate isn't even actually chocolate because it's not made with actual uh, the cacao or uh, however you say it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> cacao, that's right. That's yeah, right. Cacao. Okay. It, um, it looks like everyone else is agreeing. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, so... Thank you everyone for jumping in on that. You guys got the hang of it. Nice, easy one just to get you warmed up. Um, and the answer for which one is healthier is in fact dark chocolate as most of you are all guessing here. Uh, Jen, you wanna talk about uh, the benefits of dark chocolate? Yeah, so, um, you know, they had, there's a higher concentration of our polyphenols and um, there is still some saturated fat. Saturated fat is thought to be the fat that is unhealthy for the brain, but we do know there are some good components to dark chocolate. So we don't have to completely get rid of chocolate. That is the good news. Yep, for sure. Lots of, uh, you know, it can be a rich, rich source of minerals like iron, magnesium, uh, but make sure that you are getting a uh, dark chocolate that is 75% or greater uh, cacao content. Exactly. All right. Uh, now our next question, let's see how you guys do with this one. Uh, we have corn versus kale. So now we're making our way into, into vegetables. So what do you all think? Do you think a, a starchy vegetable like corn is going to be better for you? Or do you think a big leafy green like kale is going to be better for your brain? All right. So a lot of people are jumping in already. Very quick, very quick here. <laughs> All right, so I don't think I've seen a single person vote for corn. Uh, so I think it's pretty okay to say that like, kale is the answer that we are looking for in this case. 
Um, Kale is the winner. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Kale uh, apparently has a, has been shown to lower um, the risk of dementia and cognitive decline and has a bunch of other benefits too. Am I right? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, leafy green vegetables, not just kale, but all leafy green vegetables uh, is probably one of the most powerful foods for the brain, really concentrated in a lot of carotenoids, beta carotene, lutein, also high in really great B vitamins such as folate. So you don't want to miss out on your leafy green vegetables. Yeah, definitely. All right. So you guys have been pros at this so far. Let's see uh, how you do with this next one. Uh, what do you think is healthier for your brain in your diet? Olive oil or butter? I know which one I want to be healthier for my brain, but. <laughs> All right. It looks like people are chiming in. Lots of olive oil. Some, some people specifically saying extra virgin olive oil. Yeah. Yep. That's great. Yeah. You guys are absolutely nailing this olive oil, but I prefer butter. Uh, yeah, same. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it looks like everybody who is, uh, written in has absolutely nailed this one. Uh, so the answer that we're looking for here is olive oil as, as most of you had guessed, uh, Jennifer, you want to talk a little bit about the benefits of olive oil? Yeah, uh, extra credit to whoever put in the uh, extra virgin olive oil. Uh, it's important how the olive oil is processed and handled um, because that is really is what is going to retain the unsaturated fatty acids, those monounsaturated fatty acids, some polyunsaturated fatty acids, and a little bit of saturated, but really the benefits to the not only the brain, but also heart health. That's what we're looking for there. And if there is something that you want to get the best quality, um, it, it's it's definitely your olive oil. Butter, unfortunately, is is our saturated fat. Yeah, so not definitely not uh, as healthy comparatively to olive oil. So uh, next time you're looking to you know cook something in a pan, reach for that olive oil. Maybe end with a little bit of butter just for the flavor, but nutritionally, olive oil is the way to go. All right, our next one here. Let's see if we can stump you with this one. Uh, what do you all think? Do you think salmon or cod is going to be, uh, a better option for a brain healthy diet here? Oh man, the answers are coming in so fast here. Salmon, salmon, wild salmon. Good distinction. Yep. Wild salmon, lots of salmon. Yeah, uh, I think it comes as no surprise to any of you clearly that uh, the answer that we are looking for here is in fact salmon. Um, so, uh, you know, all seafood is neuroprotective, but what are the specific benefits that we are looking for in salmon that maybe cod doesn't have as much of? Yeah, so um, what we're looking for is, is higher concentrations of uh, unsaturated fatty acids, specifically omega-3 fatty acids. Those are the polyunsaturated fatty acids are gonna be contained in the salmon. And something that's really interesting is specifically when we look at brain health, actually all fish and seafood was associated positively for brain health. And really just one serving a week, that's all we need to get is one serving a week. And that can be just three to five ounces of fish or seafood can be beneficial. The, um, the American Heart Association though, if you really want a great heart health also recommends two servings of particularly that, that fatty fish. So you, it is beneficial to get salmon or another uh, opportunity there is something like an albacore tuna for uh, those polyunsaturated fatty acids. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, what's good for the heart in a lot of ways is also going to be good for the brain. And Henry's actually, I believe, going to touch on that during the presentation today too. Yeah, great. All right. Now the last question, uh, this one's going to be a little bit of a curveball, I think, but what do you, what do you think is going to be uh, better for your brain, black coffee or green tea? Oh, see, now we're getting, now we're getting different answers. <laughs> Everybody was all on the same page for the first four, but now we're doing the toss up here. All right. It looks like if I had to guess, green tea is kind of pulling ahead of coffee here, but there's still a lot of people coming in with coffee. Green tea, but I love coffee more. Yeah, that's understandable. Uh. <laughs> All right. Uh, so Jennifer, do you want to talk about uh, green tea and coffee? Uh, this was a, kind of a bit of a trick question, huh? 
It was a trick question. Yeah. So, um, and I did see that uh, our participants uh, are are up on their their coffee and and their tea. They're not tricked. Coffee is, you know, there's a misconception that coffee is, you know, can be bad for you, and uh, and that's just it's not true. There are some beneficial uh, health benefits to both coffee and tea, uh, particularly green tea and also black tea high concentration of um, antioxidants. And so I think that we don't need to steer clear from either of those. Yeah, uh, so the antioxidant properties, um, also there have been, there's been some evidence to suggest that caffeine has protective effects on brain health and coffee, you know, has roughly three times as much caffeine as green tea, you know, cup per cup generally. Um, so that's another great thing about both of those drinks. I think the important thing too is, um, and you had mentioned this before, Stephanie, yeah. what are you putting in the coffee or even the tea? I think yeah. people can often uh, dress their tea with things that maybe aren't so healthy either. Yeah, absolutely. So if you are like me and maybe can't do black coffee and you end up adding a lot of cream and sugar, maybe tea is going to be the healthier option for you in the long run there. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, you can't go wrong with black coffee or green tea is sort of the takeaway here. Um, all right, so I think that's going to wrap it up for activity. Thank you all so much for participating in that. It's always fun uh, doing these little activities with you at the beginning of the webinars. Um, I'm going to go ahead and toss it over to Henry now, who is going to uh, get into the proper presentation here. Uh, thanks, Henry, for taking over. Super. I uh, enjoyed hearing all of those comments and advice. And um, I am a black coffee drinker. So that was nice to hear. And I had a tuna sub for lunch. So the tuna might have been helpful, but I'm going to confess in front of you, my my uh, my priesthood here, that I did have potato chips with that tuna. So Jennifer, I think one of the things we'll talk about when we kick back to you for discussion and Q&A is, hey, how do you balance all these things? And how far do you have to go, so to speak, in order to get some, some brain healthy benefits? fits out of what you eat. So thanks. That was a super fun introduction. Stephanie, thank you. And, uh, and Jennifer, thank you as well. We'll come back and talk about this more in a moment. Um, I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking a little bit more about the science of nutrition and brain health. And um, I want to start with a look back in history, actually. There's always been a lot of interest in the relationship between what we eat and how our brain works. And um, here's a great Coca-Cola ad from the later 19th century, or might be the early 20th century. And you can see in this ad that Coca-Cola is, as it says, the ideal brain tonic. It's good for headache. It relieves mental and physical exhaustion. And in other ads, Coca-Cola was even described as a, a valuable uh, brain tonic and a cure for all nervous afflictions. Now, the reason, of course, as you may know, is, hey, back then, Coca-Cola contained a, a fair amount of cocaine. And uh, hey, at the time, people thought that cocaine was a good stimulant, certainly peps you up. But uh, Jennifer, I think we can all now agree that cocaine, in fact, not, not good for the brain, and you should generally avoid it from a brain health perspective, and a lot of other reasons, too. But of course, this was at a time when the science of human health was really still developing. You know, people literally sold snake oil as a treatment for physical maladies. So perhaps we shouldn't be so surprised that they sold soda pop with cocaine as a treatment for brain health issues. But um, hey, we've made some progress since then. So, so what have we learned? Well, let's start with some interesting scientific observations, you know, grounded in real science this time. You know, for quite some time, we've known that there's an association between high blood pressure and brain health. And people with high blood pressure are particularly likely to experience cognitive decline as they age, and they're particularly likely to go on to Alzheimer's and dementia. And we've also known for quite some time that there's two good ways to lower blood pressure before medication becomes required. And there's physical exercise, and there's a heart-healthy diet. Both of these contribute to lowering blood pressure. And, you know, in that way, um, lowering blood pressure through those mechanisms should maintain brain health and cognitive function, and it should lower the risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, and in fact, that relationship between lower blood pressure and better brain health has been shown quite clearly in several recent studies. Now, if you've been coming to the Brain Health Academy um, uh, webinars for a little while, you know that physical exercise has been shown to contribute quite nicely to cognitive function and brain health. And that's for a number of reasons, one of which is likely that exercise lowers blood pressure. But what about diet and nutrition? You know, can that make a contribution to better brain health and cognitive function itself? Well, 
let's start with um, a heart healthy diet that was originally designed to lower blood pressure. And what's in that diet? Well, here's a good example from what's called the DASH diet. The DASH diet, again, is designed to have foods that lower blood pressure. And it includes things like nuts, lots of servings of vegetables, olive oil, as we've mentioned, uh, beans and legumes, things of that nature, red wine, which is a pleasant surprise for at least some of us, whole grains, um, uh, lots of fruits, and of course, all kinds of fish, as we've talked about. Um, and that is a diet that's been designed to improve heart health in this way. Now, of course, the DASH diet does ask you to generally avoid certain things, you know, things like uh, fried food, things like red meats, things like butter, as we mentioned briefly, uh, cheese, a problem for me, unfortunately, but there we are. And, uh, you know, of course, sweets and processed foods and things of that nature. So we know that the DASH diet lowers blood pressure and improves brain health. You know, does it, is it the case that following the DASH diet guidelines, does that lead to better brain health? Well, a few years ago, a group of researchers based at Duke University decided to find out. They ran a good gold standard randomized controlled trial of the DASH diet. And what they did is they took about 124 people and these people who had risk factors for heart health and blood pressure already. They had elevated blood pressure. They were generally sedentary, not getting much exercise. They were overweight. And in this study, they measured their cognitive function and then they randomized them into three groups. About a third of them, you know, just got usual care, some brochures on how to look after themselves. A third of them got recommended and got a lot of advice for the DASH diet itself. And a third of them did a comprehensive program with the DASH diet plus exercise and weight management counseling. And then afterwards, everyone got their cognitive function measured again. And these researchers saw something pretty cool. So when they looked at processing speed, which is really a key measure of how well the brain is processing information, they showed that the usual care group actually declined a little bit, but people just doing the DASH diet showed nice improvements in their brain health as measured by their processing speed. And in fact, those improvements were about the same for the DASH diet plus exercise. When they looked at measures of executive function and memory, they saw a slightly different picture. The DASH diet was better a bit than, uh, than usual care, but the best benefits of all came from combining diet and exercise in that way. But this is a nice first result saying that, hey, what we eat can directly affect our brain function and our cognitive function. But this is a diet that's really designed for lowering blood pressure. You know, can we make it more specific to brain health? Well, scientists at Rush University, which is the home base of our guest, Jennifer Ventrelli today, did this very important work. Now, again, what we're looking at here are the key components of the heart healthy DASH diet. To make this diet even more brain healthy, these scientists looked at a lot of studies that tracked what people ate and their eventual cognitive function and Alzheimer's rates. And based on that, they made two major changes to the DASH diet. First, they saw that while vegetables are generally good, as we know, green leafy vegetables are particularly associated with strong cognitive function and reduced dementia rates. So they updated the guidelines to focus the vegetable recommendations specifically on eating green leafy vegetables in general. We talked about kale earlier, not just any kind of vegetable. Second, they saw that fruits in general, frankly, weren't particularly correlated with maintaining cognitive function or reducing dementia, but berries in particular were. So they updated the guidelines for fruit consumption to focus specifically on berries. And of course, avoiding certain foods that are still shown right here. And they called this revised set of guidelines the MIND diet. And that's what we'll talk a little bit about more right now. So first of all, how does the MIND diet work in practice? Well, these, these researchers went on to evaluate about a thousand people in a big study. They checked their dietary habits once per year, and they also gave them cognitive tests once per year to measure things like their memory, attention, and their speed. Now, to check on what people ate, they used a tool called a food frequency questionnaire, and that's shown on the left. I'm sorry, sorry for the small size. Um, but this is just a questionnaire that gets filled out and asks you how often you eat or don't eat certain kinds of foods. Um, you know, for example, uh, here's one that's uh, fish, not fried. And, uh, you know, it turns out that you get zero points on the scale if you eat less than one fish meal per month. And you get a half a point if you eat one to three meals per month. And you get a full point if you eat one fish meal per week. Now, what's really interesting about this is that you don't have to eat a brain healthy fish meal every day in order to score well. It's about making modest changes to your diet that push you in the right direction. Similarly, here's the section on red meat. 
You get zero points if you eat six meals a day of red meat, and that's eating red meat every day. You get half a point for eating four to six meals per week, that's every other day. And you get one point if you eat red meat less than four times per week. And again, I think what's really interesting about this is you don't have to completely give up red meat if you like eating it. Again, it's about making modest changes to your diet to point your brain in the right direction. So what did these researchers learn from this study? Well, some really exciting results. They found out that people who scored higher on the MIND diet had slower cognitive decline. In fact, people with the highest scores had about 7.5 years slower decline, and they also had a 53% lower risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. So those are pretty big effects on brain health based on what people ate. And there were also benefits for people who had moderate scores. Again, you didn't have to score perfectly to get these benefits. There were improvements for people who just scored in the moderate range as well. Now that's pretty exciting, um, but there's more work to be done. You know, worth mentioning that this is a study where you know the scientists ask people these questions on the questionnaires and measure their cognitive tests. But you know, maybe people overestimate how often they eat healthy on a questionnaire. You know, all of us would like to do a little bit better than we are doing. And it's also possible from a science perspective that maybe people who are beginning to experience cognitive decline also begin to eat less healthy for whatever reason. And so what's required is a full randomized controlled trial like we saw in the DASH trial to, to confirm this. And I'm excited to say that Jennifer is actually involved in running that large scale trial at Rush University as we speak. And we'll talk a little bit about where that is when we talk. So great results and a lot of promise from the MIND diet. Jennifer and I are going to talk about it more in a moment. But let's now talk about how is it exactly in the body that what we eat affects our brain health. And let's start with a simple observation. You know, here's our body and our digestive system. Obviously, what we eat goes in here in our mouth and it gets passed down to our stomach and into the intestines and then out the other end. And a sophisticated observer will note that none of this connects to the brain exactly. If food's going to affect brain health, you know, how does it go about doing that exactly? Well, two big ways. Uh, one of them we alluded to already, um, which is that, hey, the food we eat directly affects the health of the heart. And what's good for the heart health is good for brain health. And the second is that food is digested into nutrients that are delivered to the brain through the blood. So let's talk about each of these and nutrients first. Now, there's a huge science around brain health and nutrients, and I'm going to talk about it just briefly. Jennifer may mention some more things about it. But a few key things to note is that the brain does need specific nutrients, and they come best from real foods. So here's a few examples that you may have heard of. Vitamin E is something that's often associated with brain health. And I show the molecular structure right here. You don't have to be a chemist to follow it or read it. You know, what's important to know about it is that, um, hey, vitamin E is commonly mentioned um, as an important nutrient for brain health because uh, hey, it's an antioxidant which protects brain cells from damage. But what the science seems to show us over and over again is that we get the most benefit out of it, not from just consuming this molecular structure, but by eating foods, whole foods, real foods that are rich in vitamin E. For example, things like healthy oils like sunflower or safflower or soybean oil, seeds and nuts like sunflower seeds and almonds and peanuts and peanut butter. And of course, our favorites, leafy greens like spinach and collard greens. Even things like red bell peppers and pumpkins have a lot of vitamin E in them. You know, next, another thing you might hear about from time to time are called flavonoids. Now that's a pretty fancy word for invented by chemists, but these are the things that actually give colorful foods their color. And flavonoids are important because they protect against inflammation, which can damage the brain. And they also protect against cell death. And there's some evidence that flavonoids themselves play a role in neuroplasticity, how the brain rewires itself, which of course we think about all the time at Posit Science. Again, what's important is to think about eating flavonoids in their real world context. Anything with a lot of color, right? Colorful berries, colorful veggies, like red cabbage and red onions, and then flavorful things around your meal, like tea and red wine. And of course we heard about dark chocolate. Next, I'll mention B vitamins briefly. Um, these are used in protein synthesis, basically how your body builds proteins. And if you don't have enough B vitamins, you can build up harmful waste products, which can be harmful to brain health. Now, what's interesting about B vitamins is you find them in just about every kind of meat, like beef and chicken and pork. Um, you also find them in fish, like salmon and trout. Uh, but hey, if you're a vegetarian, you can find B vitamins in eggs and milk. You can find them also in leafy greens and beans. So there's ways to find them regardless of what your diet is. And the last thing I'll mention is omega-3 fatty acids, which you may have heard about before as well. And these are a key component of the membranes that surround our brain cells and the insulation that surrounds their wiring. 
And uh, here we find omega-3s and related fatty acids in fish like salmon and mackerel and cod and herring, just about any kind of seafood, really. People talk about mussels and oysters. But if you're a vegetarian or you just don't like seafood, you can think about foods like Brussels sprouts and walnuts, various kinds of seeds and all kinds of beans. And what's important to understand here is that there are a lot of important nutrients for brain health, but if you eat a varied diet full of real foods, it's pretty straightforward to get what your brain needs to stay healthy. I'm sure we'll talk about this more in our Q&A. And next, I want to come back to this second topic. Again, a little bit more depth on, hey, how is it that what's good for the part is good for the brain? Well, if we start with that idea of that brain-healthy diet, all those components we've talked about, it turns out that that leads to better heart health. We've talked about how it lowers blood pressure, but it also helps your body regulate blood sugar better, which is relevant to conditions like type 2 diabetes. And it even helps your blood clot in a more appropriate way, which means that your blood is not forming little tiny clots as it bounces around and flows through your body. So that's better heart health, but that leads very directly to better brain health. Lower blood pressure means that your brain actually gets less micro damage from literally just blood pounding on your brain as it moves through your arteries and your veins. That better blood sugar efficiency means that your brain uses energy more efficiently and your brain actually consumes about 40% of the energy that your body uses. And finally, if you're having healthier blood clotting, you're going to lower your risk for stroke. And of course, stroke is not a good thing at all to happen to your brain from a brain health perspective. So that's how a healthy diet can lead to better heart health and better brain health in the end. But you may be thinking about this and thinking, well, this all sounds very good, but hey, I, you know, I prefer a cuisine that's from a different part of this world. This all sounds very uh, focused on what we might happen to eat here in America. And scientists have been looking at this question and they've actually made various kinds of modifications for brain healthy diets that can reflect cuisines from around the world. There's a huge network of studies going on about this kind of thing. In the US, there's one called US Pointer, which again, Jennifer is involved with, um, but they're part of a network of trials going around from around the world. And in each case, they've adapted these diets dietary guidelines to fit what people eat in those regions of the world. For example, in Japan, it's very focused on creating, increasing dietary diversity on the whole, and there's actually specific guidance on green tea and seaweed consumption because people in Japan eat those kinds of things. In Finland, where some of this got started, there are adaptations that actually call for even more fish consumption and canned fish and things like that that people commonly eat in Scandinavian countries. There's a group working in Latin America that has adaptations for the diet around increased rice consumption and legume and bean consumption because people eat more rice and beans in those areas, make up their work in other ways. So this is a diet that can be adapted for the foods that people prefer, you know, kind of no matter where they are in the world or what they prefer to eat. So I'm going to head towards wrapping up to talk with Jennifer, but I want to make a few other comments on my, on my way out, which is, hey, beyond the broad brain healthy diet from the mind diet we've talked about, you may have heard of other things in the news as well. Um, so one thing that comes up in the news a lot is Tom Brady and the TB12 method. Now, if you've been with Brain HQ for a while, you know Tom Brady is our most famous Brain HQ user, and we work with Tom and the TB12 method on the approaches he's taking to physical and brain health. And a lot of the coverage of what he eats has been the crazy diet that Tom Brady eats. But actually, most of what he eats is pretty consistent with the mind diet and a brain healthy diet. Now, he designed it to be anti inflammatory rather than low blood pressure per se, but it actually has a huge amount of overlap. Very heavy on, on, uh, on, on berries, very heavy on leafy green vegetables, very low on red meats and dairy products. Um, you know, one unusual part about it, as you may see in the news, is that, you know, he avoids what are called nightshade fruits, things like tomatoes and um, green peppers, because he believes them to be inflammatory. Um, but all that said, as a scientist, when you step back and you look at that diet, it's not particularly crazy. And if you're eating like Tom Brady, you have a chance of being as healthy as Tom Brady is. Now, you may not win seven Super Bowls, but you might be on the right track as far as what you eat. A second thing you might have heard of are what are called ketogenic diets. Now, that's a kind of fancy scientific word for a diet that's very, very low in carbohydrates, very high in meat and fats. And the idea is to convert systems in your body to make them burn fat for energy rather than burning carbohydrates. Now, a lot of us might look in the mirror and think, yes, I would like my body to burn fat instead of carbohydrates. Um, but this is a very challenging diet. Uh, you have to almost entirely eliminate carbohydrates, replete them with meat and fat. It's perhaps best done under a certain amount of medical supervision to make sure you stay healthy to it. Really designed for weight loss and type 2 diabetes. That being said, there are some initial studies coming out that suggest that an approach like this might be helpful for brain health, but certainly more work needs to be done. 
And while I'm at it, I want to make a few comments just briefly around supplements and brain health, you know, brain pills. You know, if you watch TV, you might see ads, frankly, all the time for various things you can go to the drugstore to buy that will give you brain health in a pill. There are a ton of these, and every one of them says it's science-backed. You know, I'm a scientist, and I'm here to tell you that I've read the studies on these brain pills. That's what I like to do in my free time. And in my opinion, there just isn't gold standard evidence that these kinds of brain pills and supplements can help. You know, at best, they contain nutrients that maybe have promising evidence in mice, but they really haven't been tested in gold standard studies in people. And in some cases, the nutrients in these pills simply get digested in your stomach and never make it to your brain. Yeah, I really don't think there's anything in these pills that you can't get and frankly get better by eating a well-rounded brain-healthy diet like what we've been talking about today. So in terms of putting this to work, I'll leave you with a few thoughts and uh, you'll get these by email from us as well. If you're interested in, 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 in eating a bit better for your brain, there are some wonderful books out there. Uh, Martha Claire Morris, who uh, was at Rush along with Jennifer, who really was among the team that helped develop these mind diet guidelines, wrote a wonderful book called Diet for the Mind. You can get it at your bookstore at Amazon and that will help you understand this a bit better and point you in some right directions towards eating. There are tons of wonderful recipe books out there to help you pick really interesting and delicious meals focused on the mind diet. I like this one in particular, the mind diet for two, many people who are interested in eating better for their brain health, you know, maybe there's just two people in the house and why not have a book that helps you optimize what you're purchasing and, and cooking for that. And then at Brain HQ, we also have a wonderful section about brain foods and brain healthy nutrition. You can find it at brainhq.com and, and learn more about all this. So I'll, I'll stop my slides there and encourage everyone to eat a brain healthy meal this week and uh, dive into chatting with, uh, with Jennifer a bit more about this. All right, Jennifer, I've said some words about brain health and nutrition, but you are the true expert in, uh, in brain health and nutrition. Why don't, yeah, why don't you start off and just say a few more words about your work? Particularly, I understand that, um, that you, you see people, you help them every day eat a healthier diet through your work at the Choice Center for Nutrition and Wellness. What's that all about? Yeah, I do. Thanks. Um, it was a great presentation. Very informative. You. Uh, thank you. <laughs> you sound like an expert to me, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. So uh, most of my work uh, is informed. Uh, all of my work is is informed of the foundation that that's been built uh, at Rush University and and this this scientific work. Um, and so everything I do there is is research based, and I'm very grateful to be able to bring that over into helping folks. Um, I have. No more time clinically there, so so my side practice is is called Choice Nutrition and Wellness, and so I'm able to continue to help folks one on one. So I work with people uh, whether they're trying to lose weight um, or follow the Mind Diet, and um, I'm also a mindfulness based uh, stress management coach. So I help them in that area as well. You sound very busy. So are we seeing that kind of sea change in how people think about it? Do you have clients coming to you and talking about how to eat better for their brain health? Absolutely. You know, um, I at first I thought it was just because that was the world that I was living in. But now I'm seeing people, you know, it's in the news. It's 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 all around us. It's a hot topic. And I think it's because it's gaining so much more traction and um uh, scientific, uh, uh, you know, credibility. And it's, it's great. Yeah. Well, it is, I think we're really changing how people think about taking care of their brain. So it's wonderful to see it in that way. Yeah. So, you know, I think just about everyone probably has thought about eating a healthier diet, whether it's for their heart or for diabetes or for their brain. Um, but I think a lot of people hear sort of some of the stuff we talk about and Hey, they come up and there's, there's challenges in their lives. And I'm sure you see them all when they come to your clinic. So, you know, if someone comes to you and says, hey, I would love to do this, but hey, this sounds kind of expensive to buy all this kind of different food, you know, I'm on a fixed income, you know, how do you, how do you think about helping yeah. folks like that navigate this and eat a healthier diet? Yeah, this is a real, this is a real issue. And the last thing that I want people to believe is that, you know, you can't eat healthy if you can't afford the most expensive olive oil or the uh, uh, the most exotic fruits and vegetables out there. That's just, it's completely a myth. 
And mm -hmm. so one of my favorite features of the mind diet is that you don't need to follow it perfectly. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a lifestyle and you can, um, you don't have to hit every single target, but there are some tips and tricks that you can do in order, in order to save money. Um, uh, for example, the, um, you know, oftentimes nuts can be rather expensive, but sure. we know that you can get a lot of the same uh, beneficial nutrients from nut butters, which can be a little bit less expensive. So that's one thing that I recommend that people do. Mm -hmm. um, other types of things, uh, fish, if you're unable to buy fresh fish, things like canned tuna are a perfectly, mm -hmm. a perfect alternative. Um, I often tell people for produce, so for our leafy greens that are really great, and I like how you articulated the different types of um, produce to shop for, definitely look for the color. I tell people to shop the rainbow. Uh, also <laughs> shop what's in season, right? Uh, sure. um, look for sales, looking for coupons, shop in bulk, things like that. So it's definitely, it's definitely doable. I think some people come and like you say, they think, well, what I've heard is that I have to have the freshest wild caught Alaskan salmon that's been shipped that day. And that's really expensive. And if I can't get that, I shouldn't do it at all. But it sounds like that's not what you're saying. No, it's definitely not. And, you know, I, I also I'm also quite a big fan of shortcuts because oh, also this I love isn't, a shortcut. It, it, it's not just people that are on a financial budget often that I like to help, but people that are on time budgets. I often consider myself to be one of those people on a time budget that need shortcuts. Mm -hmm. um, so frozen foods, that's a common misconception that all frozen foods are bad. And wow. um, I disagree. I think if you know how to read a food label, you know what things to look for. You can find a lot of frozen foods. You can save some money and uh, it can be more convenient as well. You're right. I think a lot of people sort of think, hey, if it's frozen food, it must be processed food. And I've been told mm -hmm. to avoid processed food, but there's probably lots of good choices of frozen food that's, you know, in its more native state. Definitely. And, uh, Definitely. and how about a second kind of obstacle? Some people must come to you and say, look, I would love to eat these wonderful brain healthy meals, but I'm married to someone and they they just won't eat fish. Like, what am I supposed to do? I mean, I've got a picky eater in my household. How do you, how do you help someone kind of navigate around that? Yeah, you have to get a divorce. <laughs> That's the only option for your brain health. <laughs> That's the only option. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, no, it's, you know, and the also the only option is also not to prepare a bunch of different meals. I think that's also a really common misconception, right? Oh, like, for me, I'm going on this house. diet, right? right. You, you don't have to, you don't have to do that. Right. So, so again, um, I, I'm actually one of those people. I have a partner who, uh, will not eat fish and will, I have to either prepare something separate. And I like to then, when I go out, choose those things and mm -hmm. keep track of that, right? And so um, the, again, the, you don't have to get, you don't have to be perfect. You can choose other things that are on there. So uh, that's one, one thing I quite like about the Mind Diet is there is an easy tracking system. And then mm -hmm. uh, you, there's a score to it as well. So you can track how many items for each food you are getting throughout the week. And if it's a week that you haven't gotten all your leafy green vegetables, then perhaps you'll get more of the whole grains or vice versa. And mm -hmm. so you don't, and you can still get a therapeutic, quote, therapeutic score without having to reach all of the targets. That's that really great to hear. Because I think a lot of people hear the word diet, like a Mayan diet, and they immediately just think of, I have to restrict myself. I, you know, I can't, you know, it's all about what I can't do. But I think what I'm hearing from you is actually, there's a lot of things that you can do. It's about just kind exactly. of making better choices in that realm. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, hey, let's let's get back a little bit to supplements because this often comes up, you know, mm -hmm. I'm sure this comes to you all the time. Hey, should I be taking a fish oil supplement? Should I be taking a B vitamin supplement? Should yeah. I take vitamin D? How do you usually handle these kinds of questions in your practice? Who, who, who needs them? Or how would you tell if someone could or could not benefit from them? Yeah, the, the general recommendation that I give is proceed with caution. Okay, you have to have a good okay. reason to, to, to take one on. Um, so when you look at the research, most of the research that looks at the individual studies, even the nutrients that are contained within the same foods, oftentimes they don't have the same effect wow. of the individual foods compared to that 
in the supplement form. So because the thought is there must be a synergistic effect of the nutrients contained within the food and whatever else is in the food. That's why whole foods are better. We know that uh, whole foods are yep. better. And I don't mean to suggest that there aren't uses for supplements. We know that there's very beneficial okay. uh, purposes to different types of supplements. And that's usually when there's a deficiency. So uh, if you have reason to believe that you're deficient in some type of nutrient, usually uh, vitamin D oftentimes is a common deficiency, calcium, um, B12. But I, I really recommend that people talk to their doctor, consult their yep. doctor, get confirmation on a blood test and get the right dosage to understand what they, what they should be taking. And some of these can be harmful. Some of these can be harmful in excess I've heard. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it depends if it's, if it's water soluble or, or fat soluble, if it's a water soluble vitamin, you're, you're probably just gonna, uh, you know, excrete it out. And then you're kind of just wasting money if you're if you're taking a lot of supplements and, and you're just, gotcha. just getting rid of it later out. right yeah gotcha. right okay. um but if it's a fat soluble vitamin then um you're going to be uh containing that and preserving that in your body and it, it can build up and become toxic and it can create problems okay. in the body so yeah. talk to your doctor that makes sense mm -hmm. so i, I want to get some questions but real briefly as i mentioned you're involved in this wonderful randomized controlled trial of the mind diet uh, i think many of us are looking forward to that what uh, what's the status of that study when do you think we'll hear more from it in public yeah yeah it's really exciting so um the the mind diet trial uh is an initiative at rush um so the principal the original principal investigator martha claire no morris uh, sadly, she passed in February of 2020. So um, Dr. That. Lisa Barnes uh, took over that. And um, our sister site is at uh, Harvard School of Public Health with Dr. Frank Sachs. And he was one of the original creators, along with uh, Dr. Christy Taney of, of the Mind Diet. And so it's really exciting because, as you mentioned, uh, along as the uh, DASH diet was uh, studied, mm -hmm. this is the very first clinical trial to actually test the effects. So as we speak, our data team is, so our recruitment is closed, this intervention is over, we have already, you know, done the intervention and our participants have participated, we're so grateful for that. So um, we are just waiting now for all of our data to be analyzed and then be able to announce uh, the results of the trial, hopefully uh, very soon within, you know, the months, hopefully, a couple of months. All right. Well, that gives us something to look forward to over the rest of the year. Thank you. Uh, so with that, why don't we uh, why don't we take some questions? And I'm sure Stephanie has some good ones. But Stephanie, I'm gonna I, I saw one fly by that I thought that that uh, that we might we might put to Jennifer, which is hey, sometimes there's some real trade offs here. I saw someone ask, look, I, I understand that tuna might be healthy for my brain, but some of these fishes, you know, I've heard that they have high mercury content. You know, how do I how do I balance the good news stories and the bad news stories? And also with uh, canned fish, sometimes they are uh, preserved in water, and sometimes are preserved in oil? What are some sort of things that you should be looking for when you are shopping for uh, canned fish, for example? Yeah, these are great questions. Um, and I know mercury has been a concern and, and has been has been in the news. Is it is it okay? Is it bad? What types of things uh, should I look for? And so I know this has been evaluated a lot. And ultimately, you know, they actually put out new guidelines. And I think I think all of the big organizations came to consensus, the Food and Drug Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, the American Heart Association. And what they came to conclusion was that truly the benefits outweigh the risk of mm. mercury overload. Um, and so the highest mercury fish are going to be um, fish like shark, swordfish, oh. <laughs> king mackerel, okay. tile fish. Okay, so so they're, they're, sharks. they're not they're not as exactly they're not as commonly consumed. One type of fish that people tend to be a little bit more concerned about is the albacore tuna, but even at um, the level that is encouraged to eat it, one to two servings a week, it's it's not thought to be um, a risk. Now, for uh, special populations um, such as uh, children under the age of 12 or pregnant women, it's probably a good idea to stay at that no more than two servings per week. But for everybody else, that that recommendation is is perfectly safe. And even more than that is per perfectly safe because the benefits outweigh the risk. Hmm. 
Okay, that's very reassuring. Stephanie, what else do we have from our audience? Yeah, so a ton of great questions have come in. Um, so going back to um, talking about olive oil versus butter, that whole that whole bit from the activity, mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of people come in and I'm gonna try and summarize them all together. Um, but how does olive oil stack up against clarified butter or ghee? And um, what about if you're cooking or wanting to cook something with high heat is avocado oil mm. something that would be better for you if you were cooking something with a higher heat, something with a higher smoke point, for example. Uh, and do you have any recommendations for those? This is another one that, gosh, do, do y'all ever feel like sometimes in the world of nutrition, it depends on which way the wind is blowing. Today yes, eggs are good for us, but tomorrow they won't be good for us. No. I'm joking. We have really great uh, information. And uh, here's another area that has been extensively studied. And I think that we have more information now, better information now than we used to. Olive oil, to heat it at high temp or not to heat it at high temp, that's been a point of controversy. And there's a lot more, there's a lot more uh, research on it now. And so there has been more studies that have shown because of the really high vitamin E content and high other antioxidants and polyphenols that perhaps the olive oil can uh, sustain the really high heat temperatures. The, the, the risk, the, the thought was that the fats would oxidize and essentially the good fats would turn to bad fats and then um, uh, it would be like a saturated fat and it would be unhealthy both for the heart and for the brain. So the recommendation was don't heat olive oil at really high temperatures. Okay. And, you know, then more testing was done and it was thought, oh, well, because of the high vitamin E and the high polyphenol content, maybe it can be preserved. But then there are all these different factors in the studies happened and the, the study didn't get the same results. So essentially it was inconclusive. And so my recommendation that I have been giving people is we know that when we heat things and modify things and process things, it could potentially damage the original product. And so my recommendation is if we're going to have the most purest form, the best way to eat olive oil is raw. The best way to eat it is salad dressing, um, you know, dipping your bread in it, using it as a marinade. Um, sometimes I recommend that people keep it on low to medium heat, um, and maybe it's fine on high heat, but I still tell people that something like an avocado oil or a sunflower oil might better be, or grapeseed oil, uh, might be better at this time. Hmm. All right. All right. Well, that's wonderful to know. Um, let's go on to our next question here. Um, so here's an interesting one that I hadn't really thought of before. Um, but does how you prepare your coffee or tea matter nutritionally? You know, like if you do a cold brew or, um, like a drip or a French press K cups, for example, uh, does how you prepare it have an effect nutritionally on, uh, on the item? Hmm. That is an interesting question. Yeah. I won't pretend that I have studied that. Extensively. Okay. <laughs> I haven't uh, uh, seen anything on that particularly as well. Um, but, you know, it, it does sort of bring one thing to mind, Jennifer, that, that you and I have talked about already, which is, um, you know, I think that sometimes when you, like you said, you hear all this dietary guidance and eggs are good and then eggs are bad and so forth. And, um, you know, I think, you know, one thing that I've seen, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it is, um, hey, the biggest step we might make here is, hey, if you're eating fast food three nights a week because it's convenient, hey, try and take two of those meals and, uh, you know, have some can have a canned tuna fish salad, right? Make yourself a, make yourself a leafy green salad at home. Like the big steps are kind of moving in that direction. And, and some of the things that I think come up are, hey, these are small steps and they're great, but hey, if you've made the big steps, you should feel good about it. So if you're out there wondering, hey, which kind of tuna should I eat? Well, we're happy to chat about it, but I think you already deserve a big pat on the back because you're already doing something healthy for yourself in terms of eating tuna. Has this kind of thing come up with the, with the folks who come in and talk to you about nutrition? I love that, Henry. Yes, because I think people do get caught up in the details. Yeah. And that goes back to my point about it doesn't have to be perfect. Exactly. The fact that you've taken one or two 
you're calling it that's a big step right but really it's a small thing that you can change <laughs> and it makes a really big impact it right is. so i think you're making a really great point i love it yeah uh, and i guess oh. oh i was gonna say this might be getting into the weeds again trying to you know compare uh like finite details but um, a lot of people have been asking about artificial sweeteners and whether those are uh, mm -hmm. you know, healthy compared to sugar. Um, and, you know, for example, like our diet soda is actually going to be better for you than like a regular soda with full sugar content. <laughs> that feels like I might have been asking you that. I do want the diet soda, but let's hear it, Jennifer. Yeah, you know, if I'm being honest, I'm really not a fan of either. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into the into we'll be here all day if we get into the weeds of uh artificial sweeteners versus regular sweeteners but i'll tell you what i don't like i don't like when i hear people rationalizing that i might as well just go out and drink a bunch of regular soda because i heard that artificial sweetener is bad for me no one told you that you have to go drink regular soda <laughs> if you can't have diet soda. There's so many other options. <laughs> That's my take. That's my take on that topic. All right, fair enough. Don't use yeah. this excuse. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hey, uh, Stephanie, one I saw fly by that I found kind of interesting is, hey, you know, we've heard and I talked about, hey, processed food in general, not so good for your heart health, probably not good for your brain health. But I don't think everyone really has a clear sense of what a processed food is, Jennifer. You know, I saw one question fly by that I found pretty interesting. Hey, we've talked about canned tuna, but isn't, isn't canning tuna a form of processing food? You know, what do we really mean when we say, hey, maybe try and avoid processing? processed foods. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. Um, you know, and reminds me of uh, what I was talking about before with with the frozen foods. Um, right. uh, technically, yes, right? You put something in a package, you have to process that, right? But I think what we mean um, when we think of something as processed and potentially harmful is what does it have added to it? And mm -hmm. what can that potentially be harmful to our health? What are the big things that we know are harmful to our health? We know that preservatives such as sodium are harmful to our health. We know that sugar is harmful to our health. And we know that there's other, you know, there are some artificial sweeteners and other chemicals that, you know, people say things like, if you can't pronounce it, it's probably not good for you. <laughs> I don't know if that's, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, good bacteria that we can't pronounce that's wonderful for us. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's that sort of thing. Um, so that's that's why I like to teach people how to read food labels, not only yeah. the numbers, but the ingredient list. We have to know what's what's in our food and what we're consuming. Yeah. I mean, someone told me once, and I'm curious to hear what you think of this advice, which is, um, hey, you know, if you look at the label uh, and it's got, you know, uh, a lot of things in it, we might start to think of it as processed. You know, if I look at my can of tuna and I see that it includes tuna and oil, I'm like, okay, that's that's maybe not that processed. If I look at my can of tuna and I see it's got salt and it's got three different kinds of preservatives and some artificial color and God knows what else, I might think, hey, maybe I should pick a different can of tuna. Uh, what, what do you think yeah. of that thought? Yeah, I like that. It sounds like what, what that advice is, is kind of using common sense, right? I think, again, sort of this idea of getting so wrapped up in the details, like what are the rules and exactly yeah. what should I follow? Um you know, there is something about being an informed consumer in terms of just getting back to what's on this earth and what was here. And, and we can all read and, and look at labels and, and see for ourselves with our own eyes what's what's there. Yep. Jennifer, uh, I saw one that I want to ask on behalf of my son, and it's about using an air fryer. Now, my son's 22. He's not really thinking about brain health yet, but he had a roommate who had an air fryer. And I got to tell you, they air fried just about every possible thing you could imagine. Um, I actually don't know a lot about air fryers. You know, is that something that's maybe a healthier opportunity for people who like something crispy? Or is the way the air fryer works in the end, hey, fried food is fried food? No, it's excellent. It's essentially oh. a pressure cooker. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it uses, it uses a very small amount of oil okay. and uh, you know, I won't pretend to know the mechanics behind it, but essentially <laughs> the heat and the pressure use the small amount of oil to crisp up the food. 
and uh, it it does. You you need to have dinner at your son's house. I believe me, that would be <laughs> wonderful. He's uh, he's a good cook, and I would love to have him go cook me a meal. But now I can go there and think, oh, this might even be a, a healthy food for my brain. Then, or absolutely, not, we might enjoy a piece of fried chicken that's not unhealthy for my brain. So that's that's very cool. An excellent cool. alternative. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so we've had quite okay. a people write into us uh, asking about red wine and other alcoholic beverages. So we mentioned that red wine um, uh, was something that was included in the mind diet. Uh, what's the sort of serving recommendation to get the benefits from red wine? Um, are there other alcoholic beverages that people can enjoy that would have similar benefits? Yeah, good. Uh, for for brain health, the, the mind diet specifically, all wine, not just red wine, um, for one five ounce glass a day. And it was quite specific, actually, that um, that was what was associated with um, slowing of cognitive decline. But anything above that started to work in the reverse way. And so I think that's a really important point. The other really important point is when you look at all of the other research on not just wine, but alcohol in general is, um, you know, we know that excessive alcohol consumption can really negatively impact every organ in the body, um, not only physically, but psychologically and mentally as well. So um, it's, it's kind of a slippery slope. Uh, so we want to be careful. We want to be responsible with that recommendation. So the general recommendation I tell people is if you're not currently a drinker, don't start drinking, <laughs> don't start drinking, don't start drinking more than you currently drink. If you enjoy a glass of wine a day, great. Um, the other thing I tell people is don't save up your seven glasses of wine uh -huh. to Yes. Saturday or Sunday night. Uh, yeah, that's a very good point. You know, one question that comes to me a lot is, um, hey, in the red wine, is it the flavonoids, those things that give the red red grapes their color? And is that why we might think, um, hey, a glass of red wine might be healthy for a brain, but the same amount of alcohol in beer or a shot of vodka might not contribute to brain health? Is it because of that color in the red grapes? Or what is it, do you think? It's, it's partially that, but also partially uh, the alcohol as well. I think there's, I think there's other yeah. components and mm -hmm. that's why it's not just that. I think that's why specifically for wine, it's the flavonols, but the other health benefits for heart health, I think go further than that. Oh, okay. So if you, if you like one small mixed drink, uh, then you might be okay as well. That's well, good to know. A small one. I think we can all agree. Yeah. All right. Stephanie, so I have, have time for one more question. I have one more quick question. Uh, so one thing that we didn't really touch on too much today was uh, water intake and how staying hydrated can be healthy for your heart and your brain. Uh, do you guys want to comment on that? I will briefly say that I saw Jennifer having a drink of water as we were talking. So she probably has some, some good opinions on staying hydrated. <laughs> what should we know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's important, um, you know, hydration is important to, uh, for absorption of every nutrient. So a general recommendation that I tell people to do is have a glass of water before every meal and every snack. Um, you know, uh, I do have a calculation when I sit down with people and tell them exactly how much fluid they need. It usually ends up being close to your typical, you know, eight glasses a day, but, um, you know, that's, it's, not much more complex than that. We, we need to stay hydrated. <laughs> all right. The brain does float in a bath of salty water. So that water ends up helping us in all kinds of ways. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. Beautiful. So I think we are probably going to go ahead and start wrapping it up here. Thank you everyone for tuning into the webinar today. Uh, I'm going to put up Jennifer's information here in case you want to follow up and see uh, more information about her ventures here. Uh, hang on just a second. Um, while I do that, uh, Jen and Henry, do you have uh, any last words or any last takeaways that you want to emphasize for folks? Yeah, I'll probably just come back one more time myself to that. I hope the big lesson people walk away with is, uh, hey, eat a very diet, you know, look to these principles, but you don't have to be perfect. Um, and hey, those are the biggest steps you can do in terms of improving your diet and your brain health. There's not going to be a magic bullet that solves your brain problems. There's not a poison pill that if you eat that one thing, you're going to have Alzheimer's disease. But really think about uh, eating in that varied way. Uh, and then I'll kick it to Jennifer, our expert, to, to close us up. 
Yeah, I think you said it very well. I think, you know, I often say that it's not about diets, it's about the overall lifestyle. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, a lot of wonderful choices out there for people who are looking to uh, to uh, to work on their brain health. So thank you. Yeah. Jennifer, just absolute delight talking to you. Thanks for taking your time away from all of your work at Rush and your clinic mm -hmm. and all the things you have going on in these clinical trials to, uh, to chat with us for a little bit today. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I enjoyed it. It was fun. All right. And uh, I think with that, let's go ahead and wrap up here. Uh, for those of you that are uh, interested in seeing this recording, like I said, it'll be available on our YouTube channel next week, youtube.com slash brainhq. And our next webinar uh, next month on September or September 21st, excuse me, is going to be called Challenge On, Tackling the Most Difficult Brain HQ Exercises. Uh, so stay tuned for a registration for uh, that coming out soon. All right. Other than that, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks again for participating today. Hopefully uh, you learned uh, learned information that uh, from Jennifer and from Henry. And uh, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks so much, everyone.